Hello all, we're going to start with what in our book is known as section 6. And we're going to, of course, start with the prep skills. And so our first skill is we're going to be looking at um, writing repeated multiplication with an exponent. And so you've probably seen this before, but uh, sometimes if you haven't seen things for a while, you might forget it. So um, 4 to the third means the same thing as 4 times 4 times 4. So if you saw 2 to the fifth, that would mean 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. Sometimes people will say it; it's 2 times itself 5 times. Um, that's a little confusing because then if you take 2 times itself 5 times, that would actually give you 6 2's. What we want is we want 2 factors, or we want 5 factors of 2. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 factors of 2, and we multiply them out. Um, one of the types that we have to be very careful about is when we're going to take a negative number to a power. These two things are different. They look a lot the same, but in this one, when you put parentheses around the negative 4, see how they're around the negative 4? That means that we want the negative 4 four times. So negative 4 four times. Um, let me do one that doesn't have the same number in it. So like if we had, say, uh, negative 3 five times, that would mean negative 3 times negative 3 times negative 3 times negative 3 times negative 3. Okay, so this number in here, because it's in parentheses, every time we want it, we're going to have a negative with it. So negative 3, that gives us five negatives. And five negatives, um, every pairing of, a ne of two negatives gives a positive. So these two make a positive, these two make a positive, but then this negative on the end, we end up with an overall negative for this. And this one happens to be 243. So 3 to the 5th is 243, but the 5 negatives make it negative 243. However, if we put a negative out in the front and we don't put a parentheses around it, that means we only want the negative one time, but we want the number, the other number, four times. So again, I think it's a little confusing with the fours and the fours. So let's say we did negative 3 to the 5th. That would be negative 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 which would give us negative, and then this is 243. Now in this case, it doesn't matter because um, when you're talking about an odd power, you still get a negative both times. But watch what happens when you do an even power. I'll just do a, a, a square because it'll be uh, quick and easy. So let's say we had um, negative uh, 7 squared versus negative 7 squared. Well, this one means negative 7 times negative 7, and the two negatives cancel and we get 49. This one means we put a negative out in front and then we do 7 times 7. Well, that's negative 49 because inside gets us a 49 and then you have this negative on the outside. So you'll see when there's an even power, um, if you put the parentheses around the whole thing, you get it. Uh, positive answer, and if you don't put a parentheses around it, you get a negative answer. Where this will really um, affect people is when you put it on your calculator. If you put this on your calculator, but you mean this, you're going to get the wrong answer back. Because if you meant parentheses negative 7 squared, and you put in negative 7 squared, you're going to get back a negative answer when you should have gotten back a positive answer. So when you type this in your calculator, if you want negative 7 squared, make sure you do parentheses negative 7 parentheses squared, if that's what you mean, if you want negative 7 times negative 7. And then this last one just is um, 1 fifth squared, just showing that you could do this with a fraction. So that'd be 1 fifth times 1 fifth or 1 25th. So moving on to order of operations, we've talked about order of operations a little bit, um, and we talked about how to think of it as four steps. Um, I talked about the acronym PLEASE excuse my dear Aunt Sally because it is four steps and the my dear and the Aunt Sally um, kind of sound like they go together and we want those to be the steps that go together. So if you look at this, we've got 12 plus 3 times 4 
We don't have a parentheses or an exponents, but we're going to do the multiplication before we add. So it's not 12 plus 3, it's 3 times 4 first, and then add the 12. So 12 plus 3, or 3 times 4 gives us the 12, and then 12 plus 12 is 24. Um, if you do 12 plus 3 first and then multiply, you're going to get 60, and that's not the correct answer. Same thing uh, on this one. We don't want to do 4 times 3 first and then square it. Exponents comes before multiplication, so we're going to do this exponent first, which gives us a 9, and then uh, the 4 is still there. 4 times 9 is 36. Um, one thing I would recommend when you're doing order of operations is don't try to do it all at once or type it into your calculator and let your, cal your scientific calculator work it out for you because that's why it's called a scientific calculator is it'll do the order of operations properly. But if you're doing it by hand, you still have to do it properly. So in this case, um, we are going to do the subtraction first, even though subtraction is the last step. It's because um, what takes over in this situation is that we have a parentheses. So we're going to do what's in the parentheses first. That's going to get us 9. And then the 81 divided by 9 is 9. Here, we've got a subtraction, a division, and a times. And we're going to multiply and divide left to right before we do the subtraction. So we're going to do this part first. Okay, It's a division, so we're going to do it before the subtraction and then this division comes before this multiplication. So 52 minus 2 times 6. Then we're going to do the multiplication. Remember, we do multiplication or division left to right. We don't do the multiplication and then the division. We do any multiplication or division from left to right. So um, now that we've done 8 divided by 4 and replaced that with the 2, now we're going to do 2 times 6, which is 12 and we bring down the 52, and 52 minus 12 is 40, and that's the correct answer. All right, and this next one, uh, we've got lots of stuff in here. Uh, we've got parentheses, we've got exponents, we've got a multiplication, we've got an addition and a subtraction, so we've got all the steps to follow here. So first, we're going to do the innermost parentheses. So we have a parentheses with a parentheses inside. So we're going to do this inside parentheses first. So all that's been changed is this 3 plus 4 has been written as a, or 3 plus 1 has been written as a 4. So the negative 2 is still there. This negative 2 is still here. The square is still there. The minus 4 is still there. Um, but we just changed the 3 plus 1 to a 4. So let me neaten that up a little bit. Got a little scribbly there. So we'll get rid of all this. All right, so now when we look at this, we want to now do what's inside the parentheses first. Um, negative 2 times 4, that gets changed to negative 8. That's the only thing that got changed from this line to this line is the negative 2 times 4 became negative 8. Now that we're done with the parentheses, we're ready to do the exponents. So um, the exponent here is negative 8 squared. Well, that means negative 8 times negative 8, which is 64, minus 4. So negative 8 squared becomes 64, and we have the minus 4 here. 64 minus 4 is 60. So the very last step is to do any addition and subtraction that's left. Um, and then the last one, it says, um, just as a reminder, that in a fraction, the fraction bar acts like grouping symbols. So when you see this um, division bar here, this fraction bar, you have to do everything on top and everything on bottom before you divide. That bar acts like a like grouping symbols. Everything that's on top is grouped together. Everything that's on the bottom is grouped together. So 7 minus 9 is negative 2. 3 plus 5 is 8. And we get negative 1 fourth. What I'll see sometimes from students, though, is they'll type this into their calculator. And this doesn't get you the right answer. When you do it this way, the calculator thinks you want to divide 9 by 3 first, and then take 7 minus that and add 5. Remember, we want this on top and this on bottom done first. So if you're going to put this in your calculator, it's okay, but you have to do parentheses 7 minus 9 parentheses divided by parentheses 3 plus 5 parentheses. You've got to let the calculator know that the top was grouped together 
um, above the division bar and that the bottom was grouped together under the division bar. So if you type this in, you'll be okay and you'll get the negative one-fourth. So now we're going to move down here and look at the distributive property as our last skill and then we'll do the prep skill questions. So for the distributive property, this again is very likely something that you've seen before but may not have done for a while. When you use the distributive property, you have something out in front and then a sum or a difference inside the parentheses. And in order to do, distribute, we take what's on the outside and we multiply it through. So for instance, if I have an 8 in front, I could take 8 times 3 and then 8 times 5 and I could subtract those. So 8 times 3 minus 8 times 5. 8 times 3 gives us the 24. 8 times 5 gives us the 40, and we get negative 16. Um, just kind of as a, uh, to show that it works both ways, if you followed order of operations, order of operations would tell you to do the 3 minus 5 first, which is negative 2, and 8 times negative 2 is negative 16. So the key on this is you could do it whichever way you want, depending on the situation. In this situation, it would have been perfectly fine to do the 3 minus 5 first, what we use the distributive property for a lot is situations where you have a variable. So we can't really add y plus 6 together because we don't know what y is. So, um, but we can distribute. So we could take 4 times y and 4 times 6 and get 4y plus 24. So 4 times y is 4y, 4 times 6 is 24. And then the next one also has a variable in it. Negative 4 times 2y gives us the negative 8x. I'm sorry, not 2y, 2x. Negative 4 times 2x gives us negative 8x. And then negative 4 times, be careful, this is a negative 8. It's like plus a negative 8. And so a negative times a negative gives us a plus 32. So negative 8 square, 8x plus 32. Let me say that again. I kept stumbling around on that. So we get negative 8x plus 32. Negative 4 times 2x is negative 8x. Negative 4 times negative 8 is the positive 32. All right, so now for these prep skills questions. So if I want 3 to the 5th, I could type that on uh, the calculator, or I could type out 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. Um, if you don't know how to do a power on your calculator, I would highly recommend you find it. Um, on some calculators, it's a little button that looks like this, and you'll push 3, that button, and 5. Other calculators, you'll find a button that looks like um, X to the Y, or it might be um, an A to a B, but it'll look like a base with a power on it. Okay, so if you haven't found that yet, I highly suggest you do. Um, if you type in 3 to the 5th, um, we did that earlier. I didn't really mean to do the same problem, but 3 to the 5th was 243, if you remember. I did it with a negative before, but we already did 3 to the 5th. All right, so negative 2 to the 6th, um, if you work it out by hand, that would be negative 2 times 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 negative 2. Again, though, I would suggest you learn how to do that on your calculator. Just be careful. Make sure you do parentheses negative 2 to the 6th. Make sure you put these parentheses. So on your calculator, if you have this type, you're going to do negative 2 with the parentheses around it power 6. Just make sure to put those parentheses or you'll end up with a, a negative and it's supposed to be a positive. So negative 2 to the 6th would be um, 64 and we want to make sure that it's positive 64. Because there's an even number of negatives you're going to end up with a positive. This means 1 half times 1 half times 1 half times 1 half uh, on your calculator, again, I would uh, make sure that you know where your fraction button is. Uh, on a lot of calculators, it'll look something like a box over a box. Um, or it might just be like a dot over a dot. It, it kind of depends on your calculator. Um, that looks like a division. That's actually why a division looks like that, because it's like a, it's saying a number divided by a number. Anyway, um, and then... Uh, other calculators, you'll have something like A, B over C. And so if you see any of these buttons, A, B over C, um, what you would do here is you would type 1 and then push that button 
the A, B over C button, and then you'd push the two. And then um, you would do power four. I don't think you have to put parentheses around that on most of the, on the calculators. I think it knows that it wants that as a one half. Um, give it a shot. You should get back an answer of one over sixteen. Uh, if you have this type of calculator, um, you push this and then you fill in the the boxes. So you'll get a box on top and you put in a one, and you'll get a box on the bottom and you arrow down and put in a two, and then you would do power four. Um, or whatever your button is. It might be X to the Y or whatnot. But uh, you want to... Oh, that's a good point. Over here, too, your button for your power may look like um, an X with a little box up here also. Or a box with a box. Depends on your calculator. If you can't find it, just Google the name of your calculator and what you're trying to do. So if you had a TI-30, you Google TI-30 exponents, TI-30 fractions, and you will be able to definitely find it somewhere um, very quickly, I'm sure. All right, negative 5 squared, this one means negative 5 times 5, because remember, since the negative's on the outside, it means you it wants the 5 twice, but the negative only once. So negative 5 times 5 would be negative 25. All right, I'm going to clean this up a little bit just because we've got these are kind of squished together. Okay, so let's look at these other uh, problems here. Boy, they really squish these together. Um, let me pause for a minute and get this cleaned up, and then I'll continue. Okay, we're back. Um, one thing I forgot to mention um, when you're looking at, uh, when you're doing these problems with the fractions, um, also on some calculators when you do um, a, a problem and it may come back as a decimal and you wanted it as a, um, as a fraction, most calculators will convert. So that's another thing that you can look up. Um, some calculators um, have a button, like a thing up above their button that looks like this, like F to D, and that means fraction to decimal or decimal to fraction, the arrow will go both ways, so you'll have to push like shift and then this button and then equals, and it'll switch it from a fraction to a decimal or reverse. Um, some of the newer TI calculators have a button that looks like this, uh, and that will switch it between different forms. Another one that I think I've seen, I think on some calculators it actually just says SIMP. And then there's some Casio calculators out there that will have S to D and then like an arrow back and forth between them. All of these, this will switch from a fraction to a decimal. This will switch um, between several different forms. Like it might switch between having a square root, a decimal, and then like a repeating decimal. Um, SIMP does the same thing and so does um, S to D. So this means I think standard to decimal. So try, uh, try to find those buttons on your calculator if you can, and it might save you from having to um, do conversions on your own. Um, because a lot of times with these problems, we're really not looking for this right now. You've taken a class where you learned to switch back and forth, and we don't really want to take the time to mess around with that. It would be actually beneficial if you could do that on your calculator and let it do the thinking on that part of it for you. All right, so the next thing, um, I'm going to bring this down here, and we'll do... Um, 8 minus 10 times 2, that would be 8 minus 20, because we do the multiplication first, which would be negative 12. Then we have 4 times negative 3 plus 12, so think to yourself a minute what you think should be done first, and it should be the negative 12, because the multiplication should be done before the addition and then negative 12 plus 12 would just be 0. On this one, 19 plus negative 12 divided by 3 would be 19 plus, we're going to do the division before the uh, addition, so we're going to do this 12 type, divided by negative 3 first, which will give us negative 4, and then 19 plus negative 4 is 15. All right, go down here for this one. Now we have 4 plus 
3 times 9 minus 1 squared. And again, I would not I would recommend highly that you <coughs> pause the video right now and do these on your own and then see if you got them right. So 4 plus 3 times 9 minus 1 squared, that would be 4 plus 3 times 8 squared, or 4 plus 3 times 64. And then we're going to do the 64 times 3 before we add the 4. We don't want to do 4 t plus 3 and then multiply. We need to do this multiplication before we add. So 3 times 64 is 192. So 4 plus 192 gives us 196 for a final answer. This one we've got negative 5 squared times 4 minus 2. We're going to do the exponent before we multiply. This has a negative out in front, so this is going to be negative 25. It doesn't mean negative 5 times negative 5. It means negative 5 squared, or negative 25, times 4 minus 2. And then we do the multiplication before we subtract, so that would give us negative 100 minus 2, which means we're going to get negative 102. Uh, next, we're going to do this one, 3 plus 4 times 10 divided by 2. Order of operations says to do multiplication and division before we add. So we're going to do this multiplication first. That's going to give us 40. We still have divide by 2. We're going to divide next. So 40 divided by 2 is 20. Add those together and you get 23. Okay, so I just magically cleaned that all up for us, and we'll do 4 and 5. Hopefully we'll have room for these. So 4, we're going to do uh, still more order of operations. So parentheses, 8 plus 1 divided by 3 to the 4th. Going to do this innermost parentheses first, which is 9 divided by 3. So 8 plus 1 makes 9, and then we still have divided by 3 to the 4th. 9 divided by 3 gets done next because it's a, inside the parentheses still. So that's a 3. I take that to the 4th power. And then 3 to the 4th power is 81. 6 times 2 minus 5 times 3 minus 4 squared. Ooh, that's a bad square. There we go. Um, we're going to do the innermost parentheses first. So that gives us 6 times 2 minus 5, 3 minus 4 is negative 1 squared. It's very um, tempting, and I see students do a lot. They want to do this 2 minus 5 first. Hold off on that. We've got to get all the exponents and the multiplication done first. So negative 1 squared means negative 1 times negative 1. So this right here just becomes a 1. So we have 6 times 2 minus 5 times 1. Of course, 5 times 1, we're going to do the multiplication before the subtraction, and 5 times 1 is just 5. And so we have 6 times 2 minus 5, and then that's 6. We're going to do the parentheses first. That's negative 3. 6 times negative 3 is negative 18. Next one, we have 8 minus 3 times 2 minus 6 divided by 2 squared. Again, hopefully you've done these on your own. Give them a shot first before you watch me work through them and see if you're doing them correctly. It's easy to convince yourself you understand it when you're seeing it done. Um, when you do it on your own, sometimes you'll catch some uh, misunderstandings that you're having that you're not even realizing. So pause the video and try these on your own before you watch me do them. Okay, so we're going to do the parentheses first. Um, and it doesn't really matter. These are these don't affect each other, so we can kind of do them at the same time. Um, so I'm going to do the 3 times 2 in here first. So 8 minus 6 minus, I'm going to do this division, which is a 3 squared. Then um, the 8 minus 6 is going to give me a 2. And over here, you know, I've got that, ex that parentheses done. And then over here, I need to get rid of that exponent. So 3 squared is 9, so 2 minus 9, and then 2 minus 9 is negative 7. On this next one, don't forget that this means that we're going to do the entire top and the entire bottom before we um, do the division bar. So we have uh, on the top, 
I want to make sure that I do follow order of operations on the top. So I'm going to do the uh, parentheses before I multiply. So that's going to get me 2 times 7 on the top. Um, 11 minus 9 we can go ahead and do because it doesn't affect the top at all. Then 2 times 7 is 14 divided by 2 gives us 7. Uh, on these last ones, I think we can squeeze those in here. So 10 times 8, we're supposed to use the distributive property. On this one, I could do the this one and this one both. I could do what's in the parentheses and then multiply. But it specifically says to do the distributive property. So 10 times 8 is 80. 10 times, notice it's a negative. So 10 times negative 3 is minus 30. And we end up with this equaling 50. Negative 2 times 6 is negative 12. Negative 2 times 4 is negative 24. Negative 12 minus 24 gives us negative 36. Uh, here we won't really be able to simplify anything. We're just going to distribute and then we're done. So we get x times 14 is 14x. x times x is x squared and there's a subtraction. So 14x minus x squared. Here we're going to subtract or multiply negative 12 times 2y which would be negative 24y and then negative 12 times negative 9 is positive 108 so negative 24y and then the negative 12 times the negative 9 gives us a positive and 12 times 9 is 108 so there's our final answers for those four problems. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and uh, mesh in the um, the rest of the the rest of the classwork and group work and such. And um, one six is the only thing that you have to, or I'm sorry, section six is the only thing that you have to do this week because it's a test week. We're kind of laying off, but you do have another video that you need to watch. Um, on, uh, what is the video on? I believe it's on, uh, test anxiety. Um, I don't know that I put up a Dropbox for the last video. Um, there was another video that you were to watch, um, and also, uh, turn in. Um, but I'm not sure I remember to put the Dropbox up, so I will put that up and make sure that that's taken care of. Um, so, have a great week. Good luck on your test uh, in 1342, and uh, take care. The group section starts out just asking you to think a little bit about some financial situations. So in number one, it just asks you to discuss any experiences you've had with some of these financial situations, like being responsible for a credit card or checking account, borrowing money to buy a car or home, starting a savings or retirement account, or others. So there isn't anything to write here. Just discuss with someone else in your group, or if you're working on this alone, think about about the experiences that you've had with these situations. And then in number two, each of these situations is distinct but all have some common traits. What are they? Well, some of the common traits are that they all involve money, they all require some budgeting and keeping track of your balance. Something that all but the checking account have in common is interest, and that's something that we'll look at in a lot more detail in the rest of this lesson. Here we're comparing two accounts, one that's earning simple interest and one that's earning compound interest. In number three, we're thinking about the account that's earning simple interest. You deposit $1,000 and it pays 5% simple interest each year. So that means that in the first year you will earn 5% of that $1,000. So $1,000 times 0 0.05 means we are earning $50. So that's going to be $50 that we earn in the first year, which gives us now a total of $1,050 because we've added the 50 onto the 1000 that we started with. And then how much do we earn in the second year? Well, with a simple interest account, we would earn the same amount. So we'll earn $50 again in the second year, which is going to bring our running total up to 1100 
and then we'll earn $50 again in the third year, which brings our total up to 1150 Now in number four, we're going to do that for a compound interest account, and that works differently. That means that at the end of each year, we're going to earn 5% on the new balance. Well, in the first year, that would end up being the same. We have $1,000, we're earning 5%, so that one will be 50, which will again give us 1,050 at the end of the year. But now, I need to figure out for the second year, what's 5% of 1,050? So 1,050 times 0 0.05 means that in that year I'm going to earn $52.50. And so when I add that on to the balance, I'll end up with $1,102.50. Now I need to find 5% of that amount. So $1,102.50 times 0 0.05 tells me that in the third year I'm going to earn $55.13. Adding that on to the running total means that at the end of the third year I'll have a total of $1,157.63. Here we're taking another look at these two accounts, the one that pays simple interest and the one that pays compound interest. And we're going to fill in more years for each of those. So in number five, for account one, we already figured out that if we're earning 5% on that $1,000, for a simple interest account, we're earning $50 a year. So we started with the $1,000. After one year, we have $1,050. After two years, we're going to add $50 to that and get $1,100. And then after three years, 1,150. And then after four years, 1,200. And after five years, we'd have $1,250. Account two, though, takes a little bit more work. So we started with $1,000. And after one year, same thing. We earned 5%, which was $50. And that gives us 1,050. But then we have to recalculate the 5% on the new balance. And so we did that, and we multiplied that by 0 0.05 and that gave us $52.50 for the second year. So adding that on, we had $1,102.50. And then we multiplied that by 5% and found that in the next year we would earn $55.13. So we added that on and it gave us $1,157.63. Now we need to keep going with that. We're going to multiply that by 0 0.05, and that's going to give us $57.88. So adding that to the running total after four years, we'll have $1,215.51. Now we'll multiply that by 0 0.05. And that's going to give us $60.78. So we'll add that on to the total, and that gives us, after five years, a total of $1,276.29. So in six, you should be starting to get a feel for the fact that account two is a more complicated one to calculate interest on. If we wanted to know the amount in an account after 20 years, why would account two be so much harder to calculate? Well, account one is just earning $50 a year. We can just multiply $50 by 20 years and add it on. Account two, though, we have to recalculate that interest on every new balance, so it's much more complicated. In seven, this is the calculation used to find the amount after the first year for both of the accounts that we've been talking about. We started with $1,000 and we were earning 5% interest. So we found 0 0.05 times 1,000 to find the interest, and then we added it on to the $1,000 that was already in the account to get the new amount. 
the question then is can you think of a way to simplify the calculation so that all you have to do is one multiplication not multiplying and then adding we want one multiplication that will give us the total all in one step well if you think about this what we really want is to keep that thousand dollars and add on the five percent so we want to multiply that thousand by one to keep the thousand and then also add on the thousand times 0 0.05 to add on the five percent so that gives us something like one thousand parentheses one plus 0 0.05 if you think of this as distributing, you'd multiply the 1,000 by the 1, and then multiply the 1,000 by the 0 0.05, and add them together, which is exactly what we want. And then the simpler way to write that would be 1,000 times, go ahead and add the 1 plus 0 0.05 and get 1.05. So 1,000 times 1 1.05 would give us the new amount in the account, the 5% added to the original balance. In 8, why does the value of the compound interest account grow faster? Well, with simple interest, you calculate every year's interest on that original amount that was in the account at the beginning of the very first year. With compound interest, we recalculate the interest every year on the larger balance. So you end up earning interest on larger and larger amounts. So summarizing what we've learned in number nine, here's a way to describe the difference in growth of the two accounts. Account one increases in value by $50 every year, while account two has its value multiplied by 1.05. So the value in account one at any time would be $1,000 plus for that one, we're doing the simple interest, so it's $50 a year. We would take $50 times the number of years. The value of account two at any time looks like 1,000 times 1.05. And then for another year, we'd multiply by 1.05 again, and so on for as many years as we want. In number 10, summarizing this in another way, in account one, the simple interest account, the values grow by adding the same constant number, the $50. This type of growth is called linear growth. In account two, the compound interest account, the values grow by multiplying by the same constant number over and over. That was the 1.05. This type of growth is called exponential growth. We're still talking about the simple interest versus compound interest with the two accounts that we were using in the group portion. In number one, here's a key observation about the repeated multiplication that we found in that activity. Repeated multiplication can be expressed more concisely using an exponent. So let's look at that a little more closely. With an initial investment of $1,000 and 5% compound interest, we first figured out that we would need to multiply that $1,000 by 1 1.05 to add on 5% interest. And then we would do that over and over for each year. So if we want seven years, we would put an exponent of seven on there. So in number two, write that expression out. What would that really mean? Well, that would be 1,000 times 1 1.05 to the seventh means we're multiplying 1.05 times itself seven times. So that's what it would look like, 1,000 times 1 1.05 seven times. In number three, what is the value then after seven years? Let's go ahead and calculate 1,000 times 1 1.05 to the seventh. And that comes out to $1,407.10. In four, what about account one where we were using simple interest? For that one, we decided that the value goes up $50 a year, which was 5% of the original $1,000. So then with that account, what would a calculation look like after seven years? Well, with that one, we would have to say that we're starting with the thousand and adding on the interest, and we're going to add on fifty dollars 
7 times. So we're going to multiply by 7. So 1,000 plus 50 times 7 and that comes out to $1,350 which you can see is a little bit less than the compound interest account. We've been looking a lot at simple versus compound interest with these two accounts throughout the lesson. Let's try and pull that all together and summarize the main points. For number five, with linear growth, the value after a certain time is calculated using, well we take that starting value and with linear growth we are adding a constant dollar amount over and over, which means we can take that starting value plus the constant dollar amount times the certain number of time periods. In 6, with exponential growth, the value after a certain time is calculated using. Well, with that one, we have a starting value and then we're trying to add the same percentage every time. And for that, we actually need to multiply times a growth factor. So we end up with a starting value times that growth factor and then we have to take the growth factor to a power. So the growth factor raised to an exponent or to a power. So in 7, looking back at number 6, when we're doing exponential growth, what then is the significance of that exponent, of the power on the growth factor? Well that power tells you how many time periods you're looking at in which interest is being applied. In our example so far, that's been years, but it doesn't have to be. In 8, okay, so let's wrap this up and use what we've learned about linear and exponential growth to calculate the value after 20 years for each of those accounts. Well, for account 1, that was the simple interest account. So that's the one where we're adding $50 every year. So we started with $1,000 and we're adding $50 times 20 years and that's going to come out to two thousand dollars. For account two that was the compound interest account so with that one we started with a thousand dollars but we were multiplying by the growth factor 1.05 to the 20th power and that one comes out to two thousand six hundred fifty three dollars and thirty cents. Here we're talking a little bit about order of operations. So in number 9, if you borrow $500 at 3% simple interest for 4 years, the amount you'd owe would be given by the original $500 plus to find the interest we would need to find $500 times 0 0.03 and then we're going to pay that every year for 4 years so we also need to multiply by 4. 10 reminds us that to correctly evaluate that we need to remember the order of operations. An order of operations says that multiplication comes before addition. So in 11 that means to evaluate that we would first need to multiply 500 times 0 0.03 times 4. So that's going to be 500 plus 500 times 0 0.03 times 4 comes out to 60 and so that ends up being $560. In 12, we have something written a little bit differently. 500 parentheses, 1 plus 0 0.03 times 4. So this wants us to calculate that and then describe the order of operations that we used. Well, first of all, you need to look at what's in the parentheses. And then inside the parentheses, we need to think about order of operations again. So order of operations says, once you're looking inside the parentheses, exponents, then multiplication and division, and then addition and subtraction. So we need to deal with the multiplication first. 0 0.03 times 4 gives us 0 0.12. And then I'll just go ahead and recopy everything else. And then we're still working inside the parentheses, so we'll go ahead and do the addition inside the parentheses. And that gives us 1.12. Now that we have everything done inside the parentheses, we can move back to the larger problem and do the 500 times 1.12. And that's going to give us 560. So in 13, it wants us to look back at questions 11 and 12 and notice that we got the same answer in both. And the question is why?
Well, if we look in number 12 at the way the problem was written and think about the distributive property, the distributive property would let us do 500 times 1 and then 500 times 0 0.03 times 4. And that's exactly how what we evaluated in number 11 had been written if you look back up at number 9. So then in 14, let's describe the distributive property. What it tells us is that if you want to multiply by a sum or a difference, by something that's being added or subtracted, then you can multiply by each term in the sum or the difference separately. For example, if I wanted to do 5 times parentheses 3 plus 7, Instead of adding what's in the parentheses first, I could multiply 5 times 3 plus 5 times 7, and I would get the same result. That would give me 15 plus 35, which is 50. The cost of groceries is expected to increase by as much as 5% per year. So we're going to look at a frozen pizza that currently costs $5.60. In number one, if the price of the pizza does go up by 5% next year, how much does it go up and what's the new cost? So first of all, the increase would be 5% of $5.60. So $5.60 times 0 0.05 and that comes out to an increase of 28 cents. And then to get the new price we would take our five dollars and sixty cents that it started at and add the 28 cent increase to get a new price of five dollars and 88 cents. So in number two, we're going to complete this table by calculating new prices of several items with a 5% increase. There is a reminder, however, that there's a more efficient way to do this calculation. Instead of calculating the 5% and then adding it on to the original price, we can multiply the original price by 1.05, and that will give us the new price in one step. So we'll go ahead and do that. Potato chips is already done. For the half gallon of milk, it's $1.79. So we'll take $1.79 and multiply it by 1.05, and that's going to give us $1.88. Frozen pizza is already filled in. For pound of ground chuck, we've got $3.49, and we'll multiply that times 1.05. That'll give us a new price of $3.66. For cooking sherry, it's $9.49, and we'll multiply that by 1.05, and that'll give us a new price of $9.96. And then bag of chicken breast, it was $12.29, so if we take the $12.29 and multiply it by 1.05, we'll get a new price of $12.90. In question three, we're still talking about this 5% increase on groceries. If the pizza goes up by 5% again for a second year, what would the calculation look like? It would be $5.60 times 1.05, and then the exponent would tell us how many years, so it would be to the second power. In number four, then, let's evaluate that and figure out what that makes the pizza cost after two years. That comes out to $6.17. So in five, we're going to find out the price after more years. We've already got the price after one year being $5.88, and after two years, it's $6.17. So now we need to find after three years, four years, and 10 years. It gives us a hint that using the calculation from question three would be helpful. So for three years, I can do $5.60 times 1.05 to the third. That's going to give me $6.48. For four years, I could do $5.60 times 1.05 to the fourth. That's going to give me $6.81. And then for 10 years, that's where this calculation is especially helpful. I can do $5.60 times 1.05 to the 10th, and that'll give me $9.12.
In six, how does the price of the pizza after 10 years of 5% increases compare to what it would be if it went up by a linear increase of 5% of the original cost each year? Well, we figured out that the increase was 28 cents a year. So if I had an increase that stayed 28 cents per year, then it would be $5.60 plus 28 cents times 10 years, and that would come out to $8.40. So comparing that to the $9.12, that would be $9.12 minus $8.40 tells me that that is a 72 cent difference, and it comes out less than it would with compounding 5% increases. In these questions, we have a scenario and we need to determine whether it's linear growth, exponential growth, or neither, and then if we can, find the next value. So in seven, we've got some taxi fares as miles increase, and the first thing I'm gonna check is is it linear growth? With linear growth, it would be increasing by the same dollar amount for each mile. So first, I can look at the starting amount and after one mile, and I can subtract that to figure out what that increase is. And that comes out to a $2.40 increase. And so the question is, does that keep working from there? If I take 570 and add $2.40, do I get $8.10? And yes, I do. Does it work from there? If I add it to $8.10, do I get 1050? Yes, I do, and so on. And if we check that all the way down, it does keep working. That makes this linear growth. And then to find the next value in the list, after six miles, we would add another $2.40, and that would give us $17.70. In number eight, I'm gonna start out the same way. So if I look at the increases, I can do 13,200 minus 12,000, so that's going up by $1,200. Does that keep working? If I add $1,200 to 13,200, do I get 14,520? No. That means it's not linear. So then I need to check to see if it's exponential growth. To check for exponential, I'm going to divide 13,200 by 12,000 to figure out what I multiplied by to get the second entry. And so when you divide, that gives you 1.1. The question then is, does that pattern continue? Can I keep multiplying by 1.1? And it does. There might be a little bit of rounding along the way, but other than that, if you keep multiplying by 1.1, you do keep getting the values in the table. So this is exponential growth. And so that means to get the next entry, which would be after six years, I need to take the last dollar amount in the table and multiply by 1.1, and that will give me $21,258.73. We're still looking at different scenarios and determining whether they're linear growth, exponential growth, or neither. So in number nine, I'm going to start by checking for linear growth. When I look at the first two values in the table and subtract 10,200 minus 10,000, I find out that to get from the first value to the second, I would need to add 200. The question then is, does that keep working? Does that pattern continue? If I add 200 to 10,200, do I get the next value in the table? And I do not. It is not adding 200. So that means that this one is not linear. So then I need to check for exponential. I need to figure out if there's a multiplying pattern. So I'll take 10,200 and divide it by 10,000 and find out that to get from 10,000 to 10,200, you would have to multiply by 1.02. So then I need to check to see if that pattern continues. Can I multiply 10,200 by 1.02 to get 10,404? And I can. And this pattern does continue other than 
rounding off to whole numbers along the way. So every time I'm multiplying by 1.02 and then rounding off to a whole number. So that means that this is exponential growth. And so to find the next population in the table, I would take the last entry, multiply it times 1.02, and that tells me that the population after six years would be 11,262 after rounding that to a whole number. In 10, I'll start by checking for linear growth again, and so if I subtract 41,500 minus 40,000, it looks like that's increasing by 1,500. So does that pattern continue? If I add 1,500 to 41,500, do I get the next number in the table? Yes, I do. And if you keep adding 1,500, that pattern does continue. And so that tells us that this pattern is linear growth. And so to get the next value in the table, I would add 1,500 to the last entry, and that will give me a salary of 49,000 after six years. This is another scenario that we're checking for linear growth, exponential growth, or neither. So I'll start out by checking for linear growth. If I look at the first two entries, the value increases by $2. Does that pattern continue? If I add $2 to 42, do I get the next entry in the table? No, I do not. So this one is not linear. So then I need to check to see if it's exponential. I'll take $42 divided by $40, and that tells me to get from 40 to 42, I would need to multiply by 1.05. Does that pattern continue? If I multiply $42 by 1.05, do I get the next entry in the table? No, I do not. I would actually get $44.10, which is different from the value in the table. That means that this is not exponential growth either. So this one is actually neither linear nor exponential growth. That makes it difficult to find the next value on the list. I can't find an exact value. I could look at this and sort of eyeball an estimate. It's definitely increasing. It's increasing by a little bit more each month. So from four to five months it jumped by eight dollars, maybe after six months it would jump by 10 more. I could estimate this around $70, but I don't know that for sure.